So, as many of you now know, the war in Israel with Hamas is heating up. And unfortunately, this is bringing to light some deeper theological issues that need to be addressed by the body of Christ. I have been posting content about the nation of Israel and the Jewish people that God has established in everlasting covenant with them as a people and for the land of Israel. But to my shock and amazement, I'm getting dozens of comments of pushback on this concept from evangelical Christians, shaking my head, saying incorrect things in the comments like, God divorced the Jewish people. Israel isn't God's chosen people anymore. Jews are the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2.9, a verse that people are totally misusing, by the way. All that matters is the cross, and everyone must but be saved, which is true totally discounting and taking out the Hebraic roots of Christianity. It turns out that common sense is not so common anymore, and people have abandoned basic logic, and the evangelical church has bought into this big lie. But it's not shocking because 1 Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit says in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Okay, so there are demonic spiritual forces behind this. There's a spiritual war going on, trying to deceive and blind believers to certain truths. So where should Bible-based Christians stand on the matter of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people? We're going to take a look into that in this video. But Apologetia Studios with Jeff Durbin released a video recently giving their opinions on the matter. I really had high respect for Jeff up to this point until I realized the whole world has lost their mind. Let's take a look at his thoughts on the Jewish people in Israel. And stick with me, because after this video, I'm gonna offer my rebuttals to it and do my best to shred him to pieces. Let's look at the video. So it's just a really strange thing to say that evangelicals are like, I stand with Israel unequivocally. It's like, guys, they're sinful people. Well, what comes on the end of that typically is this next statement, which is, because they're God's people. Yes. And you hear things like that, and it just goes to show precisely what you landed on. Unequivocal support because they are God's chosen yeah. people. It's a theological commitment. That's right. Exactly right. And so we need to ask the question, is somebody who is physically descended today from Israel by blood, physically descended from Israel, who rejects the Christian message rejects Jesus Christ as Messiah and Savior, hates the message of Jesus, spits on Christians in the streets of Israel, is that person God's chosen people? Are they truly Jewish? And look, it's an important question to ask because I, look, uh, put it all on a table. You're not hearing from people who just always opposed this idea. Luke was raised in this. Zach was raised in this. My whole Christian education and Bible college education was right in line with that. Those are God's chosen people, God's chosen people, God's chosen people over there. And uh, we're sort of like the, the, the stepchildren, uh, you know, like, so that's God's chosen. <laughs> and we're like the, we're like the stepchild, like, you know, um, yeah, we get all these blessings and stuff, but they're really the apple of God's eye. Um, I say a 65 has something to say about that. It sure does. It sure does. And so let's go to the Bible itself to ask the question, does the Bible give to us this idea that the modern evangelical has today in the West about the state of Israel today, the people in the land of Israel today, does it give us the idea that we have been raised with in, in evangelicalism? Um, and I want to say, no, N no. And so I'll give you an example from, uh, from an, inspired, you know, an inspired apostle. So yeah, you are seeing Je uh, Jeff's comments on the thing. And first off, I'm not going to go word for word and tat to tat with Jeff. Dr. Michael Brown, a Hebrew scholar, already did this and completely shredded Jeff to pieces. So go watch that video where Dr. Michael Brown responds to him and shows clearly through scripture God's support for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. But I did want to refute to one of Jeff's comments directly that he said in this video, the idea that Jewish people don't like Christians, that they spit on us. This action was widely denounced by the Jewish community and considered a fringe behavior. But 
What does it matter how the Jewish people respond to Christians? What does it matter how they treat us? I've lived in a few Jewish neighborhoods because New York City, where I live, has the largest Jewish population only second to Israel. And they do not interact with Gentiles often. In my experience, most Jewish people have been neutral towards me personally in behavior. They are cordial. But even if they did spit on me, what does that have to do anything with this situation? Jesus told us to love our enemies and repay good for evil. Even if Jewish people treated me unfairly, what does that have to do with theological truth? Jeff is making a, a very, very weak theological argument in my opinion. The question is, what does God's word say on the matter, and what has God communicated to us on the matter? I don't care what Jeff thinks. Not how people treat me, and if they're treating me good or not good, that, that has little to do with the fact. So again, back to the war in Israel with Hamas. It should be noted that Israel is not at war with the Palestinians, they are at war with Hamas, which is a known terrorist organization. Although there will be civilian deaths on both sides, and I grieve for all of the lives lost, our Israelis and Palestinians alike, and I pray for both groups of those people every day. I must start off by saying this, that I stand with the Jewish people in the nation of Israel, because I feel that God wants me to. And I'm gonna show you later in this video clearly why that is the case. But before I show that to you, let me address first off what I am not saying. Although I support the nation of Israel, I do not always agree with the Israelis government's decisions. They often respond to attacks against, against the Palestinians disproportionately. And although you do have to go a terrorist kind of hard, I am not saying I want to see a war. I am not saying I am pro-war. I am not saying that the loss of civilian lives is acceptable, particularly the Palestinians. I am not saying that God wants war. War is something that humans do in relation to power struggles when two parties disagree. It is the result of the sinful condition of mankind. This is not the heart of God. God does not want to see war. But unfortunately, it is needed at times, and we have to be ready if these things happen. So it should be noted that the Biden administration is beginning to back up on their support from Israel less than a month into this conflict, which is no good. I have a feeling that the Democratic Party will eventually turn on their support for Israel more and more as the days approach. So let's get into what the Bible has to say on the matter and the viewpoint I believe Bible-based Christians should take. First off, let's address, address the lies and then get into the truth. Andy Stanley recently said this recently, and he's in so much hot water for so many different things, it's even hard to count at this point. But he made a statement that we should unhitch from the Old Testament. Or many people in my comments on my videos were saying, subtract Jewish history from Christianity. God divorced Israel in the Old Testament. Or the church has replaced Israel. All that matters now is the cross of Jesus and salvation. And there is truth to that statement. All must come through the cross. However, at the same time, God did not break his covenant with Israel. Also, many foolish people say that the Jews have no more place in biblical end times prophecy. Yet all of end times prophecy revolves around the tiny nation of Israel. It's almost head scratch. So let me go over some biblical common sense statements regarding the matter. God revealed himself to Moses this way in Exodus 3 verse 6. Then he said to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Okay, and Elevation, so Elevation Church made a song about this. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Okay, so God identifies himself and ties his whole identity into the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, naming himself after three Jewish people. And many people will say, well, Abraham wasn't a Jew. That is true. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was the first Jew. But God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 17, verse seven. So right from the jump in the Bible, <clears throat> God says this, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an 
everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. I will give you and your offspring after you the land, all the land of Cana for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So God is saying here, I'm making an ever, not just a covenant, an everlasting covenant with the Jewish people. And I'm going to give them the land of Cana, which is modern day Israel. Covenant is the highest form of commitment and only breaks within death. It's the highest form of commitment that the Bible makes. Christians do not understand the concept of covenant. And I'm going to suggest they don't understand it at all. And this is why things get lost in translation. And this is the problem why we have such a mess in the church as far as marriage and divorce and the whole LBGTQ conversation is because people don't understand covenant. That marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman meant for life. One man, one woman. So I saw the movie recently, Covenant by Guy Ritchie, Madonna's former husband. And I watched it, and it's a story of an American citizen within the Middle East and the wars that we had there. <clears throat> and what happens in the movie is his translator is from Afghanistan because they need translators to come in to help them speak to the people in Afghanistan. But what happens is in the movie is him and his translator get separated. And basically, it's just a long story. But eventually, they get ambushed and attack, and they almost die. And so you have this American soldier and this Afghan translator. And basically, this Afghan translator drags him through the mountains for days to get him back to the base. And because he was injured and wounded in an attack. And so what happens is they get separated, and these Afghan translators were promised that they would get U.S. citizenship because by translating for the American military, they were setting themselves to become enemies of the Taliban. So the soldier and his translator get separated, and then the soldier comes back to the United States to find out that his translator is basically now was denied citizenship into the United States, and now he's an enemy of the Taliban and now he's hiding for his life. And so basically this soldier goes into Afghanistan, finds him and takes him back to the United States. And that's why the movie was called Covenant because a covenant is you never give up. You never leave someone or break relationship with them. This soldier was willing to go into Afghanistan, face certain death and warfare in order to get this guy out and bring him to the United States and he does. This is the concept of covenant. It is till death do us part. And this is the strongest form of a commitment in the Bible. God made an everlasting covenant with the Jewish people. So let's go over this concept that God divorced the Jewish people. And Jeff and his crew mentioned Isaiah 65. But the scripture ends in God setting up his covenant with them. It's scratching my head why they even mentioned that. But Isaiah 54, 4 through 10 says this, if you don't understand Israel, you're confused about the Bible. Okay. Before we get into the scripture, if you don't understand Israel, the rest of the Bible is not going to make sense because it's tied into it. Okay. Let's get into Isaiah 54 here. I'm going to bring it up on screen for you. Isaiah 54 verses 4 through 10. Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the approach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord God Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandon you. But with compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of my anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will 
have compassion on you, says the Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah, where I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. And now I have sworn not to be angry with, with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So we're seeing there in Isaiah 54, God's commitment that he allowed a scattering of the Jewish people as an act of discipline, but that he will recover them again, restore them again, and that his love will never be removed from them. So again, if you don't understand the Israel and the Jewish people and the Jude Judaistic roots of Christianity, you're lost. You ain't gonna even understand the rest of the Bible. The name Israel occurs 79 times in the New Testament and never once is a description of the church. The word Jew occurs 84 times in the Old Testament and 192 times in the New Testament. The word a Christian only occurs three times in the New Testament. Without the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, we would have no patriarchs, no prophets, no apostles, no Bible, and no savior. It's almost ridiculous to even be having this conversation. The Judaistic roots to Christianity are so, so firmly established in Christ Christianity that to unhitch from the Old Testament would be the foolish thing that anyone could do. Let's get into the next scripture. It says this <clears throat> in Matthew. So in Matthew 15, the faith of the Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the Sephinity came and crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy upon me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay? So Jesus' mission was only to save the Jews. When the Gentiles started coming at him, Jesus knew that his, his mission was about, it was about to be a wrap. Okay, so Jesus identifies him, that he came to this earth to preach and teach and minister to the Jewish people. Okay, let's get into another passage here. Romans 116, there's a rap group named after them. Romans 116, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because of its power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Okay? As I look in the commentary here, the biblical commentary, it says this, Paul had no hesitancy in ascribing to the Jews a priority, both of privilege and responsibility, that the gospel was offered first to the Jew as a matter of obvious fact. Okay, so it's saying here in the commentary and in Romans 1.1.6, God offers salvation first to the Jewish people, even before the Gentiles. Okay, and this is the New Testament. This is the ministry of Jesus here. So basically we're seeing more and more. Okay, now we're also going to go into one last passage. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37. Okay, so in Ezekiel 37 right here, which is the Valley of the Dry Bones, in Ezekiel 37, verses 11 through 14. So he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them, saying, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back into the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord your God. And when I open up graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and you will settle in your own land. You will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Okay, so this is an end times passage here, again, talking about 
that the nation of Israel would be regathered to a nation once again, and God will put his spirit in them, okay? This is very, 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 very clear here, okay? Now, it should be noted that the Jews were scattered all over the world and came from a hundred different nations to come into the land of Israel, which I believe was arranged supernaturally by God, by many different people, Harry Truman, the British government, many different people that brought them back into the land. This was almost an impossibility. And this is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy within Ezekiel 37. God saying, I'm going to bring you back into the land. So if God broke his covenant with them, if God's no longer concerned with them, then why is he bringing them back into his land? Why has biblical prophecy been fulfilled in 1948 and the Jewish people are back in the land against all odds? It doesn't fit basic logic, okay? It just doesn't, okay? So I'm going to give one more nail in the coffin. Joel 3.2, okay? And this is in the last stages of the earth right before right before the the celestial signs happen and the return of jesus christ to earth which he is returning one day and he's returning soon and i know a lot of people laugh and scoff at that idea but he's coming back revelation 19 the rider on the white horse whose name is faithful and true his robe is dipped in blood he's coming for war he has a name on him that only he knows a name that is all powerful and he will come back to judge the nations but in joel 3 verse 1 and 2 this is in the last point of human history again biblical prophecy and he says in those days at that time when i restore the fortunes of judah and jerusalem i will gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of jehoshaphat there i will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel. So in the last hour of human existence, in Joel 3 verse 2, God is calling the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, my people. So if he broke his covenant with them, why is he still using these terms of endearment? It doesn't make sense, okay? And God is going to judge the nations for trying to divide the land of Israel. Now, I'm going to do a short video with my friend from seminary very shortly. And he specializes in Old Testament studies and is a pro in all things Old Testament. He does and practices many things and practices of the Old Testament. I was shocked at first because although I'm a supporter of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, I really don't get into the Jewish stuff. I'm not a big fan of the shofar. I don't put up Jewish flags. A lot of charismatic Christians take that stuff way too far. I am a big fan of it, but I didn't get into that stuff until I had a friend in seminary that basically brought me to my first Seder, brought me to and had a greater understanding of the Sabbath that I did and shown me some of these customs. Jesus, our Savior, was Jewish. <clears throat> this is just so common sense logic. I don't get this. We can't understand Christianity if we don't even understand that our Messiah is Jewish and followed all of the Jewish customs. And by the way, preached, I didn't come to abolish the law of the Old Testament. I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. We are not to abandon the Old Testament. We are not to abandon the Jews. So we're going to explore this, these issues much, much further with someone that has a lot more experience with, with, than me in Jewish traditions. And we're going to take a much deeper dive and look into this about DNA, about the Jewish people. Did God divorce the Jewish people and different things? What did the synagogue of Satan mean and all that stuff? We're going to do a deep dive. Hey, today I was just covering some basic scriptures on the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. But let me close with this very controversial statement, okay? And this is going to get me in some trouble. I got my first death threat this week, so I know I'm actually getting into things, right? In the last days, the spirit of the Antichrist is going to partner with the spirit of anti-Semitism. There's going to be a hate for the Jewish people 
for the nation of Israel. It's going to rise up. And a lot of that hate is going to be done through Islam. And its intention is to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth. They hate the Jewish people. So what we're seeing right now in the news with the hate of the Jewish people and hate of the Jewish people on college campuses all across America and the Biden administration releases statements this week that they're going to start uh, tackling Islamophobia. It's just head scratching. This administration is beyond the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, they're even worse than Jimmy Carter. <clears throat> But there is a spirit of the Antichrist, the Bible says, that's already in the world. It's a vicious spirit that wants to kill Christians, come against Christ, come against the values of Christians. We're seeing that as a new speaker in the house got confirmed and said he stands for biblical values. They said he's worse than a terrorist. So this is the spirit of the Antichrist already at work. But it's going to partner with the spirit of anti-Semitism. It's going to partner with Islam, and they're going to try to wipe the Jews off the face of the planet. Iran has this as one of their country's goals. As far as I know, the Jewish people do not want to wipe the Palestinians off the face of the planet. I haven't heard it. But yet, Iran, who partners with Hamas and the Palestinian peoples, this is one of their goals. Many extreme Muslims hold to this view, but there are many God-fearing, peaceful Muslims too, as well. In no way is this statement trying to make, trying to make claims of Muslim hate. There are many God-fearing Muslims. But when you see people turning against the Jewish people, and when you see the church start turning against the Jewish people, evangelicals, people burning Jewish flags in the street like they did in New York City yesterday where I live, you know clearly what spirit they are operating in. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. So guys, let's not be deceived. Let's have a good biblical understanding of what's going on and stand up for our values. I'm hoping that you will see today that God's plan and heart still exist for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Be blessed. If you like the video, please hit the thumbs up. It's something simple that you can do to tell YouTube to get this video out to others. Comment down below. Let me hear your thoughts, even if it isn't what I want to hear. Put those comments down below. People commenting from other countries, please let me know what country you're watching from. It's just very entertaining to see that Africa and Canada and Australia and many different nations are, are viewing the channel. And I'm just so excited to what God is going to do. And I'd hit that thumbs up, hit subscribe. I'm going to bring you the best Christian content. It's going to be no cookie cutter stuff. I'm not going to be covering Kanye West's latest Christian rant or, or how uh, the friend star basically came to Christ before he died or goofy, silly things like that. Um, only um, real hot button controversial issues um, because we need to talk about these things. Be blessed.